yours. Uh -huh. uh, I think it's going to be a very interesting program because this book is, it's not long, it's, but it's very rich. Uh, uh, Ambassador Haas served for 20 years as president of the Council on Foreign Relations. In addition to an array of other critical assignments, he was director of policy planning in the State Department under President George H.W. Bush and a White House Special Assistant to President uh, uh, George W. Bush, excuse me, and a White House Special Assistant to President George H.W. Bush. He has written or edited 14 books on American foreign policy and democracy. That's while doing his day job. Uh, so I, I want to start, as we talk about this book, uh, with a sense of urgency. Uh, I love the title, The Bill of Obligations, The Ten Habits of Good Citizens. Uh, it's timely given the time we live in and urgent given the challenges we face. Uh, so I'm going to start with an overall question about the problem. You argue that rights became central to American <laughs> democracy, but that today's rights-based democracy is failing. Can you explain what you mean? Uh, thank you for those generous words. Thank you all for getting up early. Your troopers. Uh, look, don't get me wrong. I am not against rights. Uh, all in favor of them. Uh, the idea of the United States only came about because of rights. That's what led to the protests against the British. The Constitution only got ratified with the Bill of Rights. People wanted protections against what they feared would be too strong of a central government and a too, too strong of an executive. We ultimately fought a war internally to some extent, or more than to some extent, about rights. And we still have a ways to go, as much improved as we are. A uh, notion of more perfect union, uh, Lincoln's unfinished work. So rights are central, but they're, uh, how would I put it, Bob? They're necessary, but not sufficient. A democracy cannot succeed based upon rights alone. Rights alone tend to get absolute, and if people have absolute, then how do you compromise? How do you coexist? If uh, it's an absolute that you can't have abortion because of the rights of the unborn, what about the rights of the mother? Or about the rights to bear arms as opposed to the rights to physical security? How do you balance in a democracy? Right, so don't get me wrong, they're essential, but democracies cannot succeed on a foundation of rights, because rights inevitably clash. Okay, let me follow that up. You write about the loss of common identity, nationhood, the fading of the belief that we're all part of the same community, mm -hmm. along with inequality of economic opportunity. Yeah. Why is all this so dangerous to our democratic future? Because democracy is hard. The founders, if you read them, were really skeptical about the ability. And, and the, you know, we live in a moment, think about it, where two democracies have been threatened from without. Ukraine was invaded by Russia, Israel attacked by Hamas. The greatest threat, though, historically to, to democracy is from within. It's corrosion, it's erosion, it's uh, gridlock or dysfunctionality or, or, or violence. So democracy, democracy is tough, and there's lots of reasons why democracies get into uh, uh, trouble, and we can, can talk about it, and now I've gone on so long I've forgotten your question. <laughs> Which is another In, problem facing. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Inequality of economic <laughs> opportunity. Fading of the belief that we're all part of the same thing. See, I'm used to television where I get interrupted. <laughs> I've never had to say anything. So, uh, yeah, there's lots of reasons. If democracies don't deliver, people get cynical about it. I had a conversation with the Prime Minister of Canada recently in my previous job running the Council on Foreign Relations, and he, the entire theme was, as a political leader, if I can't make Canadian democracy deliver, people will turn on democracy. And they'll say, what's so good? I think about it. Okay, here's a, here's a thought experiment. And I promised Bob I'd be short, but I'd be a little bit longer in this no, answer. Go long. The, um, <laughs> like the Kansas City Chiefs. Uh, think about and maybe it. Taylor Swift will show up. To <laughs> the, she'll show up for the Super Bowl. Uh, the, um, Think about it if you're young. Imagine you're 35 or 40 years old. And what have you seen in your life? So you go back to maybe the 2009-11, 2007 8 financial crisis, to the culmination of two unsuccessful wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, 
a pandemic for the best part of this era, stagnating wages. You see the circus going on in Washington. So if you're a young person and you don't have a larger frame of reference, you could say, you could be forgiven for saying to yourself, I've seen what American democracy does to me. I don't have a lot of evidence about what it's done for me. So if democracies don't deliver, people go, what's so special about democracies? Particularly because, again, they don't have a historical framework. So I think there's enormous pressure. On things like inequality, and that's a big debate in America, I would say it's, it's not to deliver equality, but it is to deliver equality of opportunity. So one of the big splits in America is between equality of opportunity and equality of outcomes. And we can talk about it. Uh, and I think the problem for people like me who believe in equality of opportunity is in many cases now in America, equality of opportunity has become a slogan. And if you look at the poor quality of public schooling, you look at the advantages certain people are born with and so forth, or that others can't reach, we don't really have equality of, uh, of opportunity. And when you don't have equality of opportunity, it creates pressure for equality of outcomes. And that, again, is going to be rejected by a large part of your population, which in some ways explains why we are where we are today. Yeah, you cited two losing wars. Uh, you know, Americans were disillusioned about Vietnam and Watergate, but the system held. Yeah, Why is it potentially different this time? Okay, so when I was writing this book, that question came up, and I remember having a fierce conversation or debate over dinner. People said, there's nothing so different. Now think about the 60s. The early, in 63, you had the assassination of a president. 68, Martin Luther King and Robert Kennedy. You had the Vietnam protests. Uh, later on, in the early 70s, you had, you had Watergate. That was pretty bad. Oh, yeah, it was pretty bad. But the challenges to the system, the assassinations were not revolutionary acts. This legal system held, the law enforcement system held. Vietnam, we had a big public debate. Ultimately, we, our policy evolved. Watergate, the president was confronted. He committed acts. Legal system worked, the political system worked, and he resigned. Indeed, a committee of elders of the U.S. Senate, as you know, went to see Richard Nixon and persuaded him to step down. All Republicans. All Republicans. Barry Goldwater, John Rhodes, who was the, the House Howard leader Baker from and Arizona. All these yeah. Uh, guess what? None of that applies to today. And Nixon, by the way, Nixon asked them, well, if I go through with this and I get to the Senate, uh, you're going to stay with me, right? And Goldwater said, I'm not. <laughs> well, the difference is that generation of Republicans were conservative. This generation of Republicans is radical. They are populists, not conservatives. So conservatives believe in institutions, believe in precedent, believe in the rule of law. All of those things are, are, are missing. So this is much more fundamental. I mean, um, the inability of Washington to get things done. We got things, many more things done 50, 60 years ago. Just if you look at the simple quantity of legislation, look what we can't get done now. We can't get done funding for our major foreign policy priorities. We can't get spending bills approved. We work, we never pass. Uh, authorizations and so forth. The system is broken. It is, is broken. Look what's, you know, again, House, the House of Representatives is the poster child. Things were not broken. I mean, when people cross lines 50, 60 years ago, or when policies were clearly not working, we corrected them. Now we have policies that are working that we can't sustain. I would say something like Ukraine. And in other situations, people are crossing lines and there's no pulling them back. So I think the challenges now are far more systemic and far more fundamental. As serious as they were 50, 60 years ago, the, system, the center held. I think now there's a legitimate question about the willingness and ability of the center to hold. Before I get to the Bill of Obligations, you also, do, do we need some systemic reforms in, in addition to this Absolutely, Bill of Absolutely, but we're not going to get them. Okay, so any, we could have here, there's been about, a lot of trees have been felled, writing reports about systemic reforms, do this on gerrymandering, this on the electoral college, this on this, this on that. The, some of these may be really good ideas. None of them has a chance. Every conceivable reform has, it's good you're all sitting down, has potential winners and losers. And shockingly enough, those who perceive they would lose from the reform oppose it. We can't get these reforms. It's any more than you can reform the UN Security Council. There's no reason that the UN Security Council today has, in addition to the United States and China, Russia, Britain, and France. It doesn't have India, doesn't have Japan, whatever. It doesn't have Germany. But you can't reform it, no matter how logical the, uh, the idea might be, because certain countries say, hey, we're going to lose out. Same thing with every structural reform. 
It's also hard to make structural reforms. We've had 27 amendments to the Constitution or so. 10 were at the beginning. We basically had 17 amendments over the last two and a half centuries. It's tough. We can change in this country, but structural reform is really difficult. It was made to be difficult, and we succeeded on steroids. Uh, but now, basically, and the reason you can't, and the reason I wrote this book is not that some of these potential reforms wouldn't be wonderful, but I don't think we can get them until we change the context in which American politics are conducted. And the kind of things I'm writing about don't require massive political formal changes. They're much more attitudinal and behavioral. If these happen, then I think it's good in and of itself. Plus, I think it may create a space in which the odds of getting some useful structural reforms goes up. Uh, so let's talk about this Bill of Obligations and about changing the atmosphere and maybe you get the, yeah. the structural reforms uh, and how we embed the obligations in our citizenship. Uh, take the obligation to be informed right. and to be informed accurately. Here you cite misinformation about climate change, COVID vaccines, election denialism. How do we get to the point sure. that Americans are accurately informed amid a deluge of misinformation? Now, let me just make one point about obligations. Obligations have two dimensions, all of them, whether it's getting informed or the other nine. One are the obligations of everybody in this room to one another. We're all citizens of this society, of this uh, country. So what, do we, what does everyone in this room owe everybody else in this room? And what do we want them to owe us in return? And second of all, what do each of us owe this country of ours? So obligations are those two dimensions, if you will, horizontal and uh, vertical. Uh, the idea of being informed is the first obligation. It was Jefferson who basically said it's the single most, if he had to choose between government and journal and a free press, he would take the free press. It's the only way to keep those with power accountable, transparency and the, uh, and the irony as Bob was getting to in this question, who would have thunk in an age in which we have more access to more information than ever before in human history, we could all go on the Google machine as often as we want, it is harder to sort things out than ever before. And the, the reason is there's tons of misinformation. And stuff doesn't come with yellow post-it notes. It doesn't say this is verified and accurate and this isn't. Uh, so we're, we're flooded by stuff. So I think what we need to teach in this country, because what the Supreme Court and the Congress have demonstrated, by the way, is they are not going to regulate the internet. They have had multiple opportunities and under existing law, the carriers essentially are not held accountable for what they carry. So then it's up to us as consumers. So it's the only hope I would think is we teach what I would call information hygiene or information literacy. To use an analogy, in cyber hygiene, I know none of you do this. You, none of you would write down your password and leave it next to your keyboard. And none, of you, and none of you would choose as your password, password one, two, three, four. I'm sure nobody in this room has ever done. OK, so we need similar things for information hygiene, or what's called information literacy. And we need to identify it. Like, how do you know a fact from an opinion, from a recommendation? How do, uh, how do we teach these things? What, what makes for good information? What's authentication? What's good practices? For example, one idea is never, you would not, if you got, had a bad diagnosis, if something were important, you'd go to a second doctor. Well, so why don't we get second opinions or second sources on information? None of us should, should sole source our information. Another idea, good, you're sitting down again. Social media, hint, it's called social media, not called serious media, not called accurate media, not called fact-filled media. So use it for your social life, but don't kid yourself. Don't go to TikTok or Facebook for anything that has to do with information. New Jersey has taken the lead in this. Kids in New Jersey are going to have to take courses in, in I think it's going to be the middle school or high school, and they're going to study just this. It's not going to teach young people what to think. It's going to teach them how to consume. And that ought to be a staple. Just so we teach people how to write, how to read. Every single young person in America should learn how to consume information. This ought to be in every curriculum in America, certainly at the middle school and high school level, if necessary, high, higher on. But we ought to have, here's best practices, here's things to avoid. This ought to become a staple, because that's the only way we're going to be able to not clean up, but better contend with uh, this world we now live in. Yeah, you, you have a situation in which even if people get a second opinion, they can go to another, 100%. another source that 
is going to agree with the first opinion and that they prefer. Look, I can't police it. You can't pass laws saying you've got to get multiple opinions. But what we can do, again, is uh, teach people until they can look. Again, you can't. You can lead them to water, you can't make them drink, and you could say, be aware of the political bias of this. It's this uh, understand the difference between the news page and the editorial page. Uh, what's social media, what's not, what has fact checkers, what, 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 what doesn't. So you can do all these things. Uh, they did a, PBS did a documentary based on the book. It came out a few weeks ago. You can watch it on YouTube. And one of the things I love, one of the groups we do, are kids in high school who are, have become fact checkers. And what they are doing in high schools around the country is they're learning how to look at stuff and basically say, is that a fact? How do I know? How do I go check it out? And that's the sort of thing we need to be teaching. OK, you also talk about the critical importance of Americans participating actively in the democracy, yeah. and specifically voting. How do we get more and more Americans to actually go to the polls and vote? or to mail in their mail-in ballots. It's a, look, it's a critical thing, and let me say, in the short run, i.e. 2024, in the first two obligations, being informed and being involved, take priority. This is a critical year. This is a hinge election. It's going to have long-term consequences, potentially. Uh, you can't force people to get involved. We're not going to do what Australia does. Australia requires its citizens to show up at the polls. You get fined if you do not. Uh, Americans don't like those mandates, I get it. But we just had a critical midterm election here. More than half of eligible voters did not show up. We're going to have a critical election presidential this November, at least if history holds, more than a third of eligible voters will not vote. What's so weird about that? And Bob knows this better than anybody. If you look at the last few presidential elections, tiny numbers of voters in a couple of states have outsized different impact. A few voters in uh, Ohio, or I guess now it's more Pennsylvania or Wisconsin, what have you, could tip the scales. Oh, the only reason right now we have a Republican House of Representatives, I'm not saying it's a good thing or a bad thing, though my enthusiasm for it is finite given these Republicans, is because of what happened in my state of New York, that the Democratic Party totally screwed up in organizing itself, and a half dozen seats that traditionally go Democratic went Republican. But tiny, you know, we're talking about a few thousand votes here or there would have made, had a tremendous difference. So part of it, you want to impress people that their vote is not for naught. You want them to get informed. You want them to get motivated. You want to make it easy. Employers, by the way, we should be tremendous pressure on employers to facilitate the ability of their workers and employees to vote. Uh, you know, unlike other countries, we don't do voting on weekend. It's not a national holiday. So there are things that can be done to make it less difficult, the mail-ins and, and, and so forth. Though my only exception on that, I hate the idea that people vote before the final debate is held. I would actually uh, not, I would uh, change the rules on that a little bit, but that's uh, one of my many quirks. Uh, but yeah, what I want to do is, is this year, I think what we want to do is motivate people to vote because the stakes are large and it affects their lives and they can make a, uh, a difference. Um, and that's where, and we have to think really hard about how to, how to do just that, how to, how to reach people that, again, that their future will be affected by it and they can, in turn, affect their own future. Yeah, you, you talk about the stakes being high and you also have uh, another obligation, which is to compromise and to be civil. And I think we see the incapacity to do that right now. Can I just interrupt you one thing? Not yeah. to compromise necessarily, but to be open to compromise. Right. Because sometimes, I'm prepared to say compromise isn't always the right thing, but you ought to consider it. Every single time you're faced with it, you ought to say to myself, am I better by staying pure and rejecting compromise? What are the implications of that? As opposed to compromising and getting some but not one of all of what I want. And you can go either way, but intellectually and politically, I think it's essential uh, that people think through the consequences, what's, what's achievable in compromise and what's the consequence of uh, not compromising. I think that's, and, we, and then we as voters have to be prepared to reward. You know, politicians may not be responsible, again, good, you're sitting down, uh, but they are responsive. And in some ways we, we provide the incentive and disincentive system by who we give money to or who we vote for and all that, so that's a little bit. Civility, uh, is not a hard thing. I mean, again, um, there's a real self-interest in beings. We like to be treated well ourselves. Also, in my experience, you don't win people over your, to your position by being uncivil. 
If you're uncivil to them today on one issue, you're unlikely to be able to work with them tomorrow on another issue. Uh, so I think civility is something we need to teach, we need to model. I think religious leaders, Americans don't go to a church or a synagogue or mosque as much as they used to, but they still do. And a lot of these things like civility, nonviolence, and so forth, these are things that, that people who have pulpits ought to be preaching. I'm not, I'm not asking them to take political positions, but to argue for civility, to argue for an openness to compromise, for a rejection of violence, for looking out for your fellow American or whatever. Ah, these are not really radical positions. And people who have moral authority or educational leaders or business leaders, and it gets to a larger point where if this democracy is gonna work, it's not gonna be delivered from above. It's gonna, it's gonna happen, pardon the expression, when we the people uh, essentially come together a bit and adopt some of these obligations. So does the kind of oddball compromise that we saw, which may ultimately end in deadlock anyway, between border security, tying border security, and Ukraine aid together make any sense? Well, it makes no sense on the merits, if you will. There's no reasons they are co-joined. Each ought to be looked at on its own merits, each boat on its own bottom. It's come together. What's crazy, though, is if you have people who are refusing to approve a, view, a bill on migration that gives them everything six months ago they said they needed to have, and the result is an open border and no aid for Ukraine or Israel or Taiwan. It's certifiably nuts. Uh, so the question is, can those people be penalized in the political space? That's on, that's on us. There's tactical issues. Can you break it apart, have separate votes? I think the president also has to do more to make the case. White House is a, a bully pulpit. And I think uh, the president has to use it more. He's not comfortable doing it, but he needs to do it to frame the issue. There's also more he can do uh, on the immigration issue to get into the weeds on that unilaterally. He has certain types of executive authority and discretion. And if I were advising him, I'd say do all sorts of things and dare the Republicans to stop you on the procedural argument, even if they agree with what you're doing. So I think there's a lot more that uh, good. So again, but that's not a, that's not a nor normally a compromise when I use the word is, is on the idea of uh, I want taxes to be at this level or spending to be at that level. You want it at different levels. Can we, can we find a way to uh, split the difference or something like that? That's traditionally what we think of like compromise. This co-joining of totally disparate issues is, is odd. It's kind of a legislative vehicle that's not, we thought it would work in this case. We thought we had an understanding and it's not. So my view is uh, break it apart because if it, if it if, and just deal with each one separately. So the kind of compromise you're really talking about is, for example, what we saw in the infrastructure bill. Yes, sir. Uh, where Democrats wanted probably more, Republicans wanted probably less. They met in the middle and we're having, we're not having infrastructure week, we're having infrastructure years. 100%, yeah, that's kind of what traditional compromise is. You, you, you don't get the entire loaf, you get a couple of slices, you can always revisit it, come back and try to get the rest. Uh, but that, that's kind of the, I don't know, that's the, the stuff of politics. Yeah. I'm intrigued by the obligation to reject violence and value norms. Okay. Can we really be hopeful that we can achieve that after January 6th, the attempt to stop the peaceful transfer of power, and the increasing threats against political leaders, judges, jurors, witnesses, Paul Pelosi? I mean, the, the examples are legion. You're right, and we'd better hope we can achieve it. Uh, look, I spent three years as the U.S. envoy to Northern Ireland and then another six months as the international mediator there. I've seen what violence can do to a modern Western society. Uh, it can just make the mundane suddenly an act of major risk. Oh, I don't know how many of you remember, it must, Bob, must have been what, 30 or so years ago, there were, it turned out to be a father and a son who were killing people when they went out to uh, like fill up their car with gas. And suddenly getting a tank of gas became a heroic act. Um, this society could break down very easily if political violence becomes common. So again, and, and we're vulnerable to it in part because we have more guns than people in this country. So let's not kid ourselves. We've distributed the means of violence pretty, pretty widely. And as Bob correctly says, threats have become increasingly commonplace. Uh, against judges, public officials, and, and so again, we need to delegitimize it. 
That's where, again, I think religious leaders in, in particular need to say nothing justifies political. And the legal machinery has to work. It worked pretty well after January 6th. A lot of those people were put in jail as they put in prison as, as they uh, should be. So, but yeah, we, we ought to speak openly about it. I mean, I'm not predicting anything, but the one thing I've learned in the last couple of years is we shouldn't be sanguine. We shouldn't assume that just because a democracy has worked for two and a half centuries that somehow when Moses came down from the mountain with the tablets, it also included the Constitution. Last I checked, it didn't. There's nothing necessarily permanent about it. As I said, it's, it's hard. It's vulnerable. And one of the things that's vulnerable is to a rigidity, this refusal to compromise. The other is uh, that can very easily give way to, to violence. You know, the idea of dissolution of the union or massive violence is not, it's not the stuff of sci-fi. Look what happened to it what, this past week with Texas, essentially refusing to, affect, to accept the primacy <laughs> of the federal government and the Supreme Court. This is the stuff of nullification. This is the stuff of states, right? The Articles of Confederation failed. Why? They're Constitution 1.0. The Constitution now is Constitution 2.0. The Articles were the first. Every one of the 13 states was sovereign. That's the reason, or one of the principal reasons, the Articles were not a basis, were not a blueprint for governing. How could you have sovereign entities be part of, of something that, of a unit if each could go its own way. You now have people trafficking in those ideas again. We shouldn't take things for granted. So you cite the example of January 6, people being held to account, going to prison, you say they should be, and yet we have political leaders out there calling them hostages yeah. and comparing them to the hostages who are being held in Gaza. I mean. Look, again, there's people who will do outrageous things. I can't, you can't stop that. What you can do is see they're not rewarded for it, but that's on us. Again, there's going to be whatever. I mean, now I think more of the problem is on the right. At other times in our history, it's been more on the left. But then it's on us. And, uh, to, and that's why, again, informed voting, political participation becomes important. That if, the, if certain types of viewpoints are not going to prevail, it's up to those who disagree. But democracy can't be a spectator sport. It's time to suit up. Get on the field. Lots at stake. Don't be sanguine. I mean, if you're not worried, you're not paying attention. I'm not being defeatist. I'm not being alarmist. Uh, good things can happen. But good things don't automatically happen. They don't happen automatically in the country. They don't automatically happen in the world. The natural, the natural state of things, you remember from high school science, is that systems come apart. The notion of entropy. Uh, things kind of fly off. So in order for things to stay in order, to work together, takes, takes agency, takes effort. And that's on us. You talk about the obligation to respect government service. Yes, sir. Uh, and I'm very intrigued by that, having spent a lot of my life in one way or another in politics or public service. Isn't the reality today very different from JFK's ideal of public service as a noble profession? And how do we get back to that? Well, you're right. It's been disparaged. I mean, on my short list of hated phrases, this deep state. I mean, who the hell do we think the deep state is? It's us. Millions and millions of Americans who work in the government at the federal, state, or local level. So let's stop disparaging them. We want the best and brightest to go into government and stay there, because government affects so many dimensions of our lives. So this disparaging of public service is terrible. Also, public service, you go back to like our friend Tom Brokaw, the greatest generation. Things like, you know, I'm not saying to bring back a draft, but public service was a way of bringing together poor kids of color from this part of the country with rich kids from different religions and different whatever from other parts of the country. And so I love public service for that. It's a great training mechanism. You can, you, and so forth. We need to reinvigorate public service. I'm not saying to bring back a draft. You've got the military. What, there's a lot of interesting experiments beginning to go on at the state level. Gavin Newsom has a, a, one of his commissioners, a guy named Josh Friday. And pa California is piloting all sorts of public service programs, uh, often like in gap years and whatever, 
to get young people doing things. It's good training, they mature, they meet one, other people of different backgrounds. The White House just launched this Climate Corps. I think it's, it's going to be as large, 20,000 or so kids, based upon the Cali one of the California piloted programs. Wes Moore is thinking of doing it, in, or is doing it in, in Maryland. But yeah, we ought to make pub public service uh, much more commonplace, pay people to do it. Employers could hire people who have, like the way they do now, vets. They could hire people who have done it. Schools could give preferential admissions to young people who have had, say, one or two years of, of public service. And again, I love the idea that it brings people together. Because right now, you know, when I grew up, if you remember, the big debate was between the idea of America as the mixing pot or the melting pot. Well, America now has become a country of separate pots. We go to our own churches, we go to our own you know, cable station, our own AM, FM radio uh, station. We have, we live our in own blue, social media channels. Our own social media. We live in a hard blue or hard red state. We have far less co-mingling. And one of the things I like about public service, it has the potential to bring people together. And we've got to do that because, again, this is a country based on an idea of Americanness. And it gets to one of the other obligations, maybe Bob will raise it, which is civics. But my, I'm next one. I'm just here, I'm just here <laughs> to facilitate. And, uh, but this is one of the ways we, we make it happen by bringing people together. Yeah, okay, let's go to that next one. Okay. Uh, your penultimate obligation. Yes, sir. Uh, to support the teaching of civics, yeah. which I personally regard as vital, which was commonplace in America when I was growing up. Right. How can we marshal support for this when even teaching and reading books about American history, blemishes and all, is increasingly under attack? You're right. Ain't going to be easy. Nothing's easy. That's one of the lessons. Oh, look. Uh, I think for this year, the priority is what we talked about before, informed political involvement. The longer term priorities, I would say, are public service and civics. Those are the ways that we, uh, those are programmatic things. But I would say, we talked before about information literacy. I would say information literacy is a part, one dimension of modern civics. Um, I don't think any kid should graduate from a high school or college without having a course in, in, we can call it civics, citizenship, democracy, I don't care. But they ought to learn the basics of democracy, this democracy, how we are, got to where we are, uh, how it works, what are the risks, what are the advantages, some critical history. Uh, and that ought to be a required course. That ought to be part of the core. And I'm actually working with some schools to help them develop it. Uh, and uh, do that. But Bob's right. You know, you have the fights over critical race theory. You have the uh, book banning. It's, it's actually crazy. I mean, one of the nuttier things. So people have introduced legislation in Congress for national civics, you know, to, to promote money for civics. And in the preamble to the legislation, it says nothing in, in this should be construed as advocacy for national civics curriculum. <laughs> that is crazy. The idea that a kid in Florida should learn a different story of America from a kid in Texas or a kid in California. The whole idea is we've got a common story and it's in a common fabric. So I have no illusions. But you've got to start somewhere. So I think you probably have a lot of education happens at the state and local level, much more than at the federal level. The money's at the state and local level. Colleges and universities are decentralized. That's where you have to do it. You have to do it at states. So I'm working with governors working with college and university presidents, with high schools, and so forth. That's the way you have to do it. And I've been talking to people. You know, a lot of ideas out there. It's not going to be easy. You're going to push back. I thought about it again in Northern Ireland, because what I wanted to do was teach people about what was called the Troubles, the three decades of violence there. And I think the view, my approach out of that had to be, you teach people about what happened, certain things either happen, you give them the facts, and then you expose them to various interpretations. So you don't try to impose a single history, but you do say, here's what happened, here's the facts now, here's where we are as a country, here's different analyses or interpretations, and all that. And I think that's something that uh, I haven't given up on the possibility of. Let, let me build on that a little and, and ask you, how expansive would the civics education be? For example, I'm stunned when I read the polling, and discover that a substantial percentage of people under the age of 30 either think the Holocaust didn't happen or they're doubtful about whether it happened. Yeah, I'm thinking about that. And 
I've actually added a component to it. It's a little bit of just things you need to know. <laughs> so if you're going to be thinking about democracy in America, I actually have added a component saying, what is America? Like, for example, just in the kind of cool things, when, Amer when you go back two and a half centuries ago, and when America, when this country was founded, we were a population of three million people. Now we're a population of 340 million people. Maybe all of you knew that. Not every American knows that. Uh, and I can go down. If you look at the test that the, uh, the people who are immigrants have to take for citizenship, they do a lot better on it than most people who were born into citizenship. Uh, let me just put that generously. So yeah, I think part of this has to be and I've got a, in my curriculum, I've got a, a, a whole unit on kind of the realities of America, the demographic, economic, just kind of like, just kind of almost like setting the table. You can then decide what policies you favor, but here's kind of the basics. And I've got some things about the world. I've got also a global literacy thing. That's what I introduced in my last job. We created an entire curriculum on global literacy for high school and college kids. Because I don't see how you can be a successful citizen in the 21st century of this country, or any country for that matter, and not understand the relationship between what goes on within a country and what goes on in the world. And what goes on out, you know, the world is not Las Vegas. What happens there doesn't stay there. Stuff happens that affects us, and vice versa. So I, want, I think part of being an informed citizen now is to understand something about these linkages. Last but not least, it's the obligation to put country first. Yeah. Are you hopeful that that will happen and that we will have a healthy citizenship, healthy American democracy, say, in 10 years? So let me say a couple of things. One is I, I'm really depressed that I had to include that as an obligation. <laughs> I mean, you could be forgiven for thinking it was so obvious that you didn't have to include it. but as I watched what was going on over recent years, it wasn't so obvious. So I decided it needed to be there. It's kind of the culmination. Am I hopeful? Uh, yeah, I'm hopeful. I'm always hopeful. Uh, but I'm not sanguine. I mean, the reason I wrote this book is here I am. I'm Joe Foreign Policy. That's what I've done my whole life. And I'd be meeting with groups like this one. And people would say, what keeps you up at night? You know, is it China or Iran or Russia or whatever happens to our climate? And I said, yeah, those are, all, those are real big problems. What really scares me is us. And it's our infighting and whether we will be willing and able to play a large role in the world that for 75 years has put the world in a pretty good place. And so I don't, I don't take that for granted anymore. And the reason I wrote this book then is I wanted to kick off a national conversation about exactly what we're talking about this morning and how to think not just about rights but about obligations, again, to one another, to the country, and then how we, how we try to influence people's attitudes and behaviors on one hand and how we try to, in particular, work on civics education and national or public, uh, public service. And that, so am I hopeful? Yes, I, you know, I, I mean, how could you give up? We're about, in, in two and a half years, we're going to mark the 200, 250th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence. This is a, a, a great experiment worth extending. But no one should take it for granted. The, and it, nothing's, nothing's forever. Uh, and I think we've had some wake-up calls in recent years. If, if January 6th wasn't a wake-up call, if what's going up on in Washington every day now, you know, we kind of become a little bit a nerd to it, and I think that's dangerous. So I think there's, and the good news is, if we had slightly greater political, informed political involvement this election, it could have massive out, you know, outsized impact. And so, yeah, I'm hopeful, but um, I don't assume it will turn out right just because I think it should. And so that's why, you know, that's why I bother to you know, have these conversations and write these books, is I feel a sense of urgency that a lot is at stake and we're at one, you know, I never know what inflection point means, so I'll just say we're at one of those crossroads. And I want people to feel the urgency and to basically ask this. One of my best friends, we have, we have a men's group where we have lunch, you know, uh, I'll keep it right, I won't say who he is, where we have lunch or dinner with a bunch of guys about once a month. 
and we talk about all sorts of stuff. And one of the things we were talking about the other day is none of us wants to feel after this year that there was anything else we might have done that might have made a difference. It's a little bit like an athlete. You never want to feel when you go into the big game that you didn't give your all. And you don't want to have any if onlys. You don't want to go through life the morning after with if onlys. That's why I feel about everything we're talking about this morning. I don't want to feel an if only. Well, gee, I could have done that. I should have done that. Uh, and that's what, I, that's what I'm trying to, that's the idea I'm trying to sell to a lot of other people. This is a critical moment to, to get involved and to encourage others to get involved and to get involved in an informed way. Okay, now I have a question for Joe Foreign Policy. Uh, 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 even though you're going to do a whole program on this later. Yes, sir. Uh, how dangerous is the world today? How threatened <laughs> is American leadership and democratic values globally? Yeah. Uh, and how should the U.S. deal with Ukraine, the Middle East, and the threats from All Russia in and China? Uh, look, uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's a simple question. <laughs> well, the answer is the world really is dangerous. And it is for a couple of reasons. One is we've seen, and it's not, by the way, it wasn't something that a lot of people predicted, because it's only, what, three and a half decades ago that the Cold War ended on terms that were remarkably favorable to us. And we were at the end of history, some people yeah, thought. Yeah, some people thought, not quite. History has a way of uh, asserting itself. And what we obviously see is the revival of geopolitics in the Middle East, in Europe, in uh, the Asia Pacific, and of war. Not, you know, not just internal civil wars, but cross-border wars. Brutal. We see the, uh, at the global level, we saw it with the pandemic, we see it with climate change. An enormous gap has opened up between global challenges and the willingness and ability of the world to come together to deal with them. So that's happened. We're seeing new technologies emerging which have the potential to do good or do ill, but the ability or willingness of the world to constrain their ability to do ill is uh, not, not obvious. And then everything we've been talking about this morning. The principal reason the last 75 years have turned out pretty well and, and they have, by the way, if you think about it, turned out remarkably well. No great power war between two great powers. Cold War stayed cold and ended on terms that were remarkably good for us. More people live in democratic rule than have ever done in the history of mankind. The average uh, lifespan is several decades longer over the last 75 years. Uh, the natural order of things is to, to live in independent countries. That wasn't true before 75 years ago. We still lived in the age of colonies and uh, empires. Wealth, we now have a degree of wealth in the world, even if it's not evenly distributed. That's still more people are living at much higher standards of living than, and I'd say that's great. It didn't just happen, though. It happened for lots of, the main reason it happened is the United States took the lead, not acting alone, but took the lead in building institutions after World War II and building alliances and made the system work, made the, and created an international system. And what's happening now, though, is the United States is having fundamental doubts about our willingness to do that anymore. And some would say we can't afford it, or, people have, or some would say it's not worth it, or they have very different ideas about what's desirable. So I think a lot is at risk. So it's this combination that history, if you will, has resumed. And it's all happened, these global challenges come, new technology, all at a time the United States may not have the unity or the bandwidth or the willingness to play this kind of large role that has helped create a, a relatively benign world for three quarters of a century. So yeah, it makes for a, a really dangerous moment in history. It's almost what I said about the country I don't think you can be sanguine. You can't sit here with confidence and say, here's what this, this country and its democracy are going to look like in five or 10 years. Will we be functional or dysfunctional? Will we be peaceful or violent? I'd say the same thing about the world. I don't feel we can be sanguine. Good news is good things can still happen. Bad news is they, they won't just happen automatically, and they won't happen without us. So we've become, in some ways, that's what ties together this last question of Bob's and the previous conversation. In some ways, the biggest variable in the next era of history has become the United States. And you know, it wasn't something that was obvious. We kind of thought we were on a bit of autopilot. Well, we're not on autopilot. We have become the biggest question for the future of ourselves and for the future of the world. Uh, you know, that's, that's reality. Thank you all very much.
Uh, thank you, Richard. Uh, thank you. Buy this book. It's a terrific book.